Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 625. That's 625 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well. How am I? All good, all things considered. Came back from a little pump session today, which was quite nice. First of the week, took a few weeks days off just to kind of rest and recover and get my spirits back up and running and then once that metro booming album dropped i thought you know what the best place to go to listen to this from the beginning to the end is definitely the gymnasium and i have to say it definitely was a great experience it definitely definitely was a great experience but apart from that things have been pretty pretty stable here um reaching towards the end of the year not many events going on that are really that captivating for the most part i think rave wise the only thing that i've seen that's been kind of half decent has usually been i think the weekend of december 10th there's a few decent events on that i may um you know have my eye on in terms of me wanting to go to later but that is still kind of tbc but apart from that just keeping my head down churning out as much content as possible recording these podcasts and sharing them with you lovely people out there but one thing i have been thinking about these last few days and something that i think I'm going to make sure that I promise myself to do forever and ever is really, really refrain and hold back from any kind of communication with anybody that I kind of like, look up to, um, want to emulate, want to supersede, see, you know, get inspiration from whatever it may be. I just don't think it's worth it. I think all those interactions for the most part are terrible, especially once that person becomes aware of your content and then they start asking you to delete videos and stuff. It just becomes a little bit much. And it's not videos, it's only video. And I think this is the first time and the last time I'll ever do something like that ever again in terms of taking something down for someone because I was in the you know midst of kind of confusion and stuff and I wasn't necessarily um, in my senses in terms of, uh, realizing that maybe that wasn't a correct thing to do you know I'm, if you're free to put out what you want to put out I'm free to interpret it the way you want to interpret it if you don't like it cool no problem but I shouldn't be taking anything down especially if there's no ill intent behind or anything as well that's ridiculous and extreme you cannot like it of course that's particular. that's perfectly fine but asking someone to delete a video really does make no sense because everyone's already seen it anyway and for the most part nothing really ever gets deleted from the internet there's always a copy laying around somewhere or somebody's always mirrored it out there somewhere the other but i think going forward i'm definitely going to refrain from doing that because i just feel like it's not even more so the person's fault or the people's fault i just feel like when you're a niche and somewhat underground type person or you're a niche underground celebrity as in you're not known to the global to the general public to the normies but you're known um to a real heightened extent to a very small and concentrated group of people it can be very difficult to navigate that whole world of people coming up to you and saying something or like, you know, making you aware that they're a fan or something in real life. It can be really strange to handle. I always kind of harken back to my very awkward and very clunky exchange with Juliana Huxtable um, you know, in, in Panorama by Bergheim, which did not go well. Um, she just finished playing. I had a great time dancing in the corner, you know, shucking out, sweating through my T-shirt, um, my feet all sore panting people was dilated and i thought you know what let me go over and say hi and just say look i really enjoyed that set and you know there, it wasn't like i disturbed the conversation or i came in mid you know um cry or whatever or mid hug it was like a bit it was a you know there's a lull in the group i can notice it I stepped in said hi and i don't know five words or something i don't know enjoyed yourself something along those kind of lines and the uh, amount of recoil um confusion disgust and um uh petrifiedness or whatever that word is look that kind of washed over juliana huxtable's face as i walked over was a reminder that you know what maybe coming up to a stranger even if you are a fan of what they do and telling them that you like what they do especially if it's a woman would never really come off that well it's very hard for it to come off um non-creepy non um, without having any intention behind it it's very difficult just to come off plainly as a kind of hey i'm like a person in the comments but in real life sort of thing it just doesn't work and i was like oh my god this is so awkward i feel terrible and i just kind of stepped away and record i was like you know what i'm never doing that again and i think that might have been the same evening actually yeah i think it definitely was the same evening that i bumped into the guy from crossbreed kiwi 
and we had that exchange about me being a fan of crossbreed from afar and all that madness happened whatever it may be but that was one of the clearest examples for me that I need to refrain from it in general and just kind of leave people like that alone for the most part because it never really goes well I think of some other occasions where I've kind of bumped into celebrities who've kind of been the high level ones who have been really nice and the weird thing about it I was just thinking is that some of those experiences they can go either way right they can go really well they can go really badly there's really never a middle ground like just a meh experience but I also think the the kind of the unfairness of it if you are somebody that's known as a celebrity and stuff is that if you just treat somebody with a more a minuscule amount of just like what do I say respect a minuscule amount of kindness and you just kind of indulge them for that couple of seconds or minutes or whatever it may be it really does go a long way and usually for the most part you end up having a fan for life one example I can think of from years and years ago was when um, I think I was with my parents or something and went, went to a, I think I was with my parents I think I was on the way to a church or something and we stopped over at the Tesco Express somewhere I think in Bow and we bumped into Graham Norton he was like shopping that time I think it was late at night and if I remember correctly he might have been wearing like this is again fashion head I think he was wearing like a denim jacket and Ricardo Cavalli like combats cargoes or something I don't know if you guys remember that but back in the day Roberto Cavalli used to make these cargoes that were all the rage for the moment I think I guess all the gay guys loved them and they had these mad crazy embroidery on the side of them they're probably quite Y2K now they're actually if people pulled them out they'd probably be quite trendy but I remember seeing Graham Norton wearing a pair with like this mad amount of embroidery to the side of the leg and you just hanging around in Tesco Express buying and shopping what you wanted to you know get for himself late night at Tesco's and I guess at that moment also you have to imagine Graham Norton was hotter than fresh fish grease that Saturday show I forgot what it's called maybe it's a Graham Norton show I forgot the name of it was really popular it's one of the rare things that me and my parents used to sit down and watch all together as a family and kind of watch you know because for the most part TV was getting kind of crappy you'd have your computer upstairs in your room you might have a PSP or a Game Boy so everyone's kind of doing their own thing but I remember those sort of events like X Factor and that sort of Graham Norton show were the main things that you'd come down and sit down and watch so even if you weren't a fan of like terrestrial tv you'd know who graham norton was so bumping into him was like whoa this is as big as seeing any any big celebrity and i just remember him being really nice to everybody that bumped into him i remember we wanted to go over and say hi but we were all shy we didn't want to say anything i remember i might have waved at him from afar but i remember just watching him from afar interacting with people like just being shocked as we were right here you are looking for the heinz beans and then suddenly you see graham norton just like swandering down the aisle everyone was flipping captivated and shocked and he was just minding his business doing his life and enjoying himself but I just remember him just being really courteous and kind to everybody that stopped him and he did that thing that I remember Harry Styles did where when I bumped into him at Alibi one time where he did this thing where he didn't let you linger but he also made you feel like you were seen so there was no opportunity for you to like sit down and try and cut your elbow in a bar and have a long chat but he still made you feel like you had a uh, a worthwhile interaction and then you kind of went on your way it was really nice that sort of thing and to this day i'm a harry styles defender until the day that i die and still to this day i'm a you know um edward uh, from, which, graham norton sorry um supporter until the end that i die too so that can be the that can be the conundrum that happens if you're like a low level person or you're like a niche celebrity because you know if you do give this person a bad interaction most likely this is going to sour your their impression of you in their eyes forever i guess if you're you know you don't really care maybe you have too many of those interactions it just happens it kind of evens itself out but you also know if you go the extra mile and just you know exchange a couple of words with somebody it can also help them to be a fan of yours for life so it's a really weird place to be it's a bit of a double-edged sword in that regard and also you're not too sure if you indulge somebody in conversation you don't know if you're going to get a me who kind of understands social cues and is aware that sometimes I can go on and on and on and on and I can kind of excuse myself pretty easily from a conversation or read social cues for the most part and exit but there are also those people who exist who have no idea what social cue is and they just keep going on and on and on and on and they never leave you alone and it kind of turns into the thing of like have I caused a rod for my own back sort of thing and you end up kind of bemoaning you know giving this one person time when you usually give everybody the finger so it can be a little bit difficult to deal with but for me personally 
I've made this solemn promise that I'm never ever doing that again because I feel like in general it does sully the relationship it does make it hard to kind of see their art the same way and in general also I just don't want to be put in a position where somebody's asking me to delete videos or take this down or edit this and no it's not stop the game that I've come in this for I did this for my own kind of enjoyment so I could kind of share my own opinions you know I don't care if anybody sees them as you can clearly see from the stuff that I upload on this you know all that stuff that I talk about on this podcast I'm clearly not trying to you know ride the algorithm rave right was well, i'm clearly not trying to ride the algorithm wave i'm just doing my own thing and i'll be damned if i'm doing my own thing until this moment and now suddenly i turn into the flipping self-centering guy where i'm deleting stuff to appease certain people and the reality is you can never appease everybody no one's ever going to be satisfied with the amount of work and level of work that you do so i'd rather just keep it storm do my own thing and kind of go from there but yeah that was my little brief um and then the other thing i remember the other thing i want to talk about that's pretty heartbreaking is this news courtesy of sky news man really really heartbreaking rapper Pasilu jailed over a brawl that erupted after his friend stabbed to death the brit was normally sentenced to two charges violent disorder and possessing a bottle as an offensive weapon really really heartbreaking news man this kid is going to be in jail for a couple of years man bang your doors Pasilu. bang your doors so the story goes as follows the rapper Pasilu has been jailed for his part in an attack on a lone victim shortly after he's best friend was fatally stabbed the salu a brit awards with nominee who has been named the bbc sounds um, who was named who was named the bbc sound of 2021 was jailed for two years and nine months in relation to attacking coventry town center four years ago imagine having a case like that hanging over your head for four years and then you get jailed for two years nearly three years for this offense absolutely nonsense in the early hours of september 1st 2018 a fight broke out near a nightclub which resulted in salu's friend fidel glasgow 21 being fatally stabbed so he died a death over which nobody has faced any charges salu was part of a group of men who chased another man from the scene that man a 23 year old was eventually cornered and attacked by the group and later needed emergency surgery and 10 days recovery in a hospital salu 25 admitted violent disorder after being caught on cctv hitting the victim with a tree branch a number of time so he gets into some sort of scuffle or skirmish with another group of guys um, unfortunately his friend succumbs to his injuries and dies and in the melee they then chase after one of the assailants that is in that group i'd imagine to corner him because i think they probably couldn't clock who uh, you know ended up kind of giving the final death blow to his friend and they cornered him so they could kind of you know get one of those guys back you beat the guy up close to an inch of his life i'm assuming he was in the hospital for 10 days but he's alive he's not dead then you go to jail for two years and nine months that's a piss take in my opinion that's a piss take unless he had other charges already on his docket unless he was on a warning or something because maybe there's more to the story than meets the eye this doesn't make any sense how can your friend die in the in, again it's different i guess it'd be different if it was premeditated for instance your friend dies in a fight and then the guys run away but then you see the guy next day at a club or something or in a shop and then you go and try and you know beat him up or smoke him of course then that would maybe change the charge but if in the melee if in the actual event that is going on where your friend gets rushed you then chase away the assailants you corner one of them and you beat them up and, but they don't die as well they, they're severely injured don't get me wrong it doesn't matter you know because of course you're going to do that to protect your friend and to obviously get some get back and revenge and then you're going to prison for two years that's insane that's legitimately insane hopefully he's he's on those kind of sentences that mean like if you do a certain amount of years you get released on good behavior or something but from what i've seen so far this is a ridiculous sentence the man 23 was eventually cornered and attacked by the group and later needed emergency surgery and 10 days of recovery in hospital um Saturday 25, I can't that ready. He was acquitted in March on second violent charge uh, relating to the earlier brawl that had resulted in the death of Mr. Glasgow. So he got acquitted for that charge because I guess they couldn't maybe find the evidence to pin that he actually did do it. But I guess because there's CCTV of him hitting the guy with a branch, that's why maybe they prosecuted him or other bits of evidence. Fair enough. But it was convicted but he was convicted of possessing a bottle as an offensive weapon telling jurors at Warwick Crown County that he had smashed and brandished it to defend himself so oh my god man how can you get rushed by a group of guys pick up a bottle from the floor smash it and kind of ward them off and kind of you know use it as a flipping sharp object to warn them to come near you then in uh in the aftermath of that same event go and chase one of the assailants down corner him beat him up he's still alive and then get two years this makes no sense 
especially if this is kind of a self-defense thing if like they were just minding their business and then another crew came along antagonized them started the beef they they kind of defended themselves because that guys those guys were attacking them and then it resulted in one of their friends dying and then they go to prison it's like what if I to defend, Salu's barrister, Jonathan Wodick, sorry, Jonathan Woodcock said Salu had used a stick rather than a branch and it was not easy to determine how many blows he had delivered. It is very ineffective. So it's a very unattractive uh, offense. Of course it is, says Miss Woodcock. It is not, he is not involved in bringing the victim to the floor. He does not have, he does not make an effort to keep another defendant away. It's to his credit that he does that. No, so he does make an effort to keep another victim. Okay, cool. So I guess he was doing something, but he was also making sure his friends didn't go too far by the sounds of it. He does make an effort to keep another defendant away. It's to his credit that he does that. He was not party to most of the serious aspects of the violence. What happened to Mr. Fido could have happened to anyone in the melee. Judge uh, Peter Cook told Selu, a number, uh, anyone harboring the view that you are a young man being hard done by should pause to reflect that despite having a conviction of for carrying a knife three years earlier, which resulted in a suspended sentence in the course of these events, you used two bottles and a stick. Ah, okay, that makes more sense why he got there. Okay, I guess they're using that as a cause that he didn't learn his lesson and he was involved in some sort of mel. I don't know. I, I still think this is insane, personally, for me. This still doesn't make any sense. It was your intention to turn the bottle into a jagged weapon. Um, Judge Cook said Salu and others had acted like a mob, adding that if you had, if you do that to somebody, it's likely to end up seriously injured or dead. Well, they didn't end up dead, they're seriously injured, of course, because they killed his friend, for goodness sake. What happened to Fidel could have happened to anyone in a melee, but it didn't it happen to him. This judge is a prick. He added, I want you to focus on getting your life back on track. Well, thanks, isn't it? Give me two years. Thanks. Coming out and making the most of your talents, which I trust to me that you will be able to do. Yeah, how can you trust that? You have no you have no guarantee that he's going to go in there and be okay. He could go in there and get flipping absorbed by the wrong group. He could go in there with frustration, with resentment in his heart and succumb to things that he probably didn't want to and come out a completely different person. Hopefully I don't I hope that doesn't happen, but this is not something that you could just bounce back from. He's not going to a fucking, you know, youth offenders con you know, concentration place or whatever, maybe your correction center. He's going to a legit prison with actual males and adults and shit. This is nonsense. I have no difficulty in accepting you are a young man who has already um, suffered impacts of your career by virtue of these proceedings. The judge Cooks also said he was taking into account that Sally had been close to Mr. Glasgow and that he had made a laudable effort to help people from disadvantaged backgrounds. I think this is a nonsense case personally for me. He doesn't deserve to be in prison for that long. I guess because in the UK we don't maybe have self-defense laws or something. I don't really know too much about you know the law when it comes to violent offenses and what deems what and if you got convicted because i guess if you got a suspended sentence that does basically equate to you kind of being out on remand or bail and it? it's kind of the same thing right you're out on bail condition so if you got suspended sentence you're probably not meant to get in trouble for a period of time and maybe he did it within that period of time so hence why he maybe have got some added time on top of it but i still think two years and nine months for getting some get back on somebody that legitimately killed your friend in front of your eyes and that person not dying and you making an effort to make sure that person didn't die is absolutely crazy to me in my honest opinion because he could have joined that rabid kind of mob that they're talking about and just kind of went crazy on the guy but he by all accounts was pulling some of his friends back stopping them from going too crazy and it still led to him essentially losing two years of his career for this absolute nonsense but i guess the only one silver lining of it is that for sure this won't happen again He's at that age where he probably can. Hmm, that's probably you can't really say that, don't it? He's twenty five. There's new rappers popping up every single day. Just the other day, I saw a clip on Shade Borough of this guy called Jay Silver, who I didn't really know too tough about, who said he maybe failed in his career because he had a moment and then kind of disappeared and didn't really make the most of it. You don't know in it really when it comes to music. I guess it would have been beneficial if this happened during the COVID. If, if you were sentenced during COVID and you went in, that's one thing because everything's closed down. By the time you come out, everyone else is coming out. But to stay in this time and then, you know, in the interim that he's gone, Jay has popped up again. You know, it kind of changes the whole dynamic of his appeal in terms of what he does and their kind of similarish sounds or whatnot. Maybe the looks, I don't really know. But yeah, either way, really, really unfortunate situation. Bang your doors, Pasilu. You did not deserve to go down for two and a half years, in my opinion. That's all, more than two and a half years. That's absolutely crazy and egregious sentence. But hopefully, this is a turning point and a fork in the road for you where you can start doing the right things when you come out. Because that kid's way too talented to be throwing you all away like that, in my opinion. 
then I went to quickly touch upon this, which I saw today, courtesy of Ami Leon Dor regarding these New Balance Rainers. And the first thing I went to mention about this was that, thank God, thank Christ, this isn't that same model that they were banging and rinsing out for the last couple of years, it feels like, and they've even had them in a high. I forgot what number it is. Is it a 250 or something? I forget what number it is. Let me see if I can find it. Ami Leon Dor New Balance. What is it? I said 550. They were absolutely rinsing these, right? These flipping 550s. So I'm happy now we have like a, just a different silhouette that we can kind of enjoy, even though, you know, these suede numbers here at the top are absolutely maddening to look at. Really, really beautiful. But I thought these 550s were really, really done into the ground, being like a dead horse. I'm completely over them, even though they look really nice in this picture here. I'm kind of over that silhouette. I need something fresh, I need something new. So when I saw these, I was like, oh, finally fresh and new shoes and these really speak to me these are probably the most quintessential me shoes i've ever seen in my entire life they're essentially like what i would describe as like a new balance version of a of a hiking boot or maybe a new balance version of a lava dome is that a lava dome is that what i'm thinking of i think i think i'm of a lava dome let's see if i'm thinking of a lava dome there was a nike shoe an acg that i love nike acg lava dome I think there was a high, there was a high one I'm thinking of, a particular ACG that I like. There we go, I think that's that one. Okay, maybe it's a lava dome, maybe it's that original. But yeah, they, and these two, oh, R.I.P. Gua, man, R.I.P. Gary, gone for never, never forgotten, Guarism as well. He had a particularly stupendous blog when it came to covering all this stuff. But this is maybe what I was thinking more so along the lines of these kind of ACG lava dome type boots. I've actually got an OG pair of these actually in my collection like from 1980 something that i've absolutely cracked and banged up that i'm probably gonna end up pulling out one day or the other but that's what i was basically thinking that um, um that new balance rainer kind of looks similar to in terms of its shape in terms of its appeal the eyelets and whatnot it kind of looks similar to that but maybe not but anyway regardless love it regardless it's more of a mid boot less of a high maybe it's giving you dana vibes because I feel like now because of winter everybody's obsessed with hiking boots or outdoor boots in general that they can wear to cross country events or that they can kind of splash about in town and you know wait outside for ubers and not worry if a car comes by and splashes their feet because they're wearing gore-tex suits or they have these you know um waterproof uppers on their flipping shoes which i don't think these particularly have actually let's actually scroll down to the details they have a proper upper that they don't it's brown new back overlay gore-tex underlays oh of course it does it has a gore-tex underlay vibram sole too which is absolutely booming vibram rubber outsole eva foam co-branded logo and tongue woven a million door logo on the inner sole debossed flying nb logo on the saddle and they're made in china but yeah, I love these, man. These look really, really, really good. I'm really up on these for the most part. The laces are nice. These kind of metal D-ring eye stays as well. I'm pretty, um, or oh, eyelid, sorry. I'm really, really down on this embossed logo on the side. I kind of get a boner from. I do like the fact that it's not printed. I do like the fact that it's maybe not the traditional stitch sort of thing. It's kind of something that's been embossed and stamped onto a leather. I think that look really nice once you wear those shoes in a little bit. They will look stupendous. The fact that it's got Gore-Tex lining is absolutely stupendous also because it means even though they look plush and they're surrounded by suede and mesh that your feet are going to be icy and dry and non-moist and all that malarkey when you wear them every day so i'm a big fan of that they look pretty stupendous looking down also you don't have that annoying pointy toe they're not aggressively boxed over also it just got that nice kind of rounded shape on the toe box there that makes them easy to wear um bonus now i'm gonna say bonus points on laces but not another kind of faux pas of mine that i always kind of despise is when they don't lace the shoes properly for a product shoot these are just horrible they're always meant to go kind of over here like it's meant to go as a bottom mitt's meant to go flat this is meant to go a little bit over as you know again it's just like a ocd type of thing but once you see it you kind of unsee it that's a bit disappointing but i don't mind the little green hit there is beautiful to match the little green hit there on the outside the logo also as you can see there you got the embossed new balance stamp there with the ami leondo written down there also on the underneath that looks really plush some nice details on the laces 
maybe this would have been extra nice to see but i don't know how much it would have cost them to do but if they were able to get some metal tips on the end of these and have the new balance and amelion door kind of embossed on them that would be nice they probably would be a friends and family thing i wonder why they don't do that anymore nowadays it feels like maybe nike do that quite often but other brands don't usually do that friends and family editions it's mostly a nike thing you don't really see ali that's doing them right for the most part of their collaborations but that that, that i feel like is a like far better use of influencer seeding then would you be just giving the influencers the same thing everyone else is going to buy ahead of time i don't really think it works as well as they probably think it does for the most part i think you're better off because the guys that people would want to emulate and look at to kind of see if they look well they don't really wear seeded things like the kids who like asap nast or like rocky or like lucas sabat when's the last time you've seen those guys wear seeded you know sportswear sneakers they don't really do that right they don't really flex them that way like they used to in the beginning when they when they were first coming up those guys would be wearing those things and they would be kind of showing them off because they're so happy to get a nike link i feel like nowadays maybe because they're not getting paid and they realize that nike is basically taking advantage and using their platform and their reach to kind of you know get people to or get their shoes to sell out but aren't properly compensating them they kind of pull away from it I'm not too sure, maybe because they've got other deals that maybe doesn't work. But either way, um, it is a little bit upsetting to see that kind of thing. I would I would like to see more friends and family, then allow, allow the influencers to get that, and then let us just buy all the regular shoes, because then it gives us more as well to kind of purchase, which is obviously you know a dream too far, I think, and probably too sensible. Uh, this is another little point I'll make also that I like. I do like this midsole outsole match. I feel like there is, as much as I do enjoy a good gum sole, a good contrasting midsole a good off-white midsole i think it is nice sometimes when you have especially with a hiking boot you have like a solid color on the midsole and the outsole so you have this nice it gives this nice kind of perception that it's a bit thicker it kind of gives it that kind of you know that oomph that kind of security test that bravitas that you would not necessarily get if it was a different color in my opinion but again what do i know when it comes to these things in it what do I know? But yeah, I'm a big fan of those. Oh, what am I doing? I went backwards for no reason. Let's see. This gray colorway also is fucking fantastic. Before we get into the other colorway, which one we got here? We got two. What colorway? Did they say what color they are? Name? Gray in the boot. One, two. Okay, one, two, three. So I guess you got that brown, you got that gray, and you got that kind of creamy color. I do like. Unfortunately, it looks like that green hit only applies to that one color, that green hit on the top of the sort of a uh, collar i guess you'd call it only applies there but i do like this color also i think they'll all work really really well i don't think you'd be that bothered if you ended up with only one pair maybe maybe this might be the least favorite i guess out of the both maybe these will probably end up being the first ones that people will probably run to because they remind everybody of those kind of traditional sort of kind of you know hiking boot type colorways in terms of the browns the blacks that little hit of green as well kind of reminds you of like a safety orange a good bright little pop to kind of give your shoes a bit of you know oomph, a little bit of jazz a little bit of je ne sais quoi and then you've got these ones as well this kind of like creamy creamy custody brown with the purple Oof, these look absolutely banging those are nice it's kind of like an aubergine sort of vibe going on here that looks like a new is that new what is that? that's new book isn't it it's not even suede these are going to look fantastic once they're warning this is the kind of shoe that reminds me of like a tom Sachs mars yard they look stupendous obviously brand new but once you beat these bad boys into the ground and give them a bit of action they're going to look stupendous and the price too 205 for this i think is a bargain for me considering how expensive new balances have been over the last few years i feel like 205 for these are really really good so when they do eventually come out i think they're kind of meant to come out on the 15th i think or something I would definitely say to you to keep your eye out no they're coming out december 16th so definitely keep your eye out if you haven't already these are gonna be very very popular i feel like for most people when they do eventually do come out don't don't delay don't delay today honestly try your best to get them i know a million dollars flipping hard to get you know stuff legit because obviously it always sells out but i do like them look at that little color i like that there's a different this is a good look here i wonder what this is i wonder if this is like a different application color wise or different material i don't think it is i think this is both the same on the collar you got this kind of this little um y collar thing that on the other pair is green it looks like it's a different shade of cream and off-white or whatever brown than it is to the main body but i don't think it's a different material i just think it's a different um different color for the most part but i do like it, it looks really really nice 
there's not a lot of kind of stitching of logos on everything's kind of been embossed it looks like embossed there embossed on the tongue i wonder if they've got anything on the heel tab it doesn't really show you does it uh anything on the back of the heel i think there might be something there also but for the most part i'm a fan of it leather insoles gore-tex lined as well i love them man i feel like it's gonna look really nice can't wait to see them in real life if i end up getting a pair fingers bloody crossed in it that's all you can hope for then of course when i was on that million door i was stumbling around and of course i had to look around and double check some other things also that i thought were really really good and one thing that popped out that i liked that kind of gave me an idea of maybe doing something was this amelion don new era micro cord yankees hat which is essentially a new york yankees hat reinterpreted by amelion door and it's really amazingly tastefully done of course as you can see i'm not the only person who liked them because both colors are completely sold out at 65 pounds for a a, a dad hat essentially or a strap back with a, a flipping new york yankees logo on the front but if you look at the minor details you look at the shape and this is something i need to kind of emphasize especially once you know off the back of me talking about the moa lola flipping hat or trucker hat that i got which someone did give me a good idea about if i wanted to i could actually um well, which i'm gonna probably end up doing i could take this hat actually which i'm probably gonna do and just cut the logo out really well around the edges and then just buy a blank trucker of the similar sort of colorway or maybe what i'll do is maybe get this color which i always have preferred which is this one this color from this past plus blue ribbon hat that i've got which is more of a red blue and white as you can see even the shape of this is way better in it look at look at the shape of that past blue ribbon one it's absolutely gunky and full of crap but look at the shape it's far nicer shape as compared to this crappy thing here i just don't like it it sits really weird i think on my head and overall so i'm probably going to get this and cut it around the logo and then probably get it stitched onto one of these bad boys and take them to a tailor and see if that works so i'm really looking forward to doing that going forward but aside from that just to take a look at the shape look at the shape of this just had to sit in i know they've probably stuffed it with some bubble wrap or something to give it a bit of um i maybe they haven't so i'm gonna I'm be, maybe i'm hating and they've actually constructed this hat from the ground up to make it sit this way and it has this nice curvature around it it looks amazing it looks pressed looks the perfect shape for those guys that used to do you know back in the day those kids on flipping subways or trains they'll do the tricks with their hats and they're dancing and flicking up in the air and stuff and they, i felt like you always needed your hat to have like a particular kind of curvature for it to work this is what works with it and obviously it being corduroy also think about that how they're able to kind of keep that shape is important really impressive but the other thing that kind of made me think of an idea that i wanted to do going forward is that i've always wanted to make a staple london hat which is really strange because you know i have a love relationship with this fucking city but i thought that would work really cool in the kind of new york yankees type logo set because you know new york and london have a similar sort of vibes so that people are obsessed with the city as much as people are obsessed with new york and people talk about city being the best in the world as they do about that place and i feel like i flip on this logo um done in this kind of i would say hand-drawn way it feels like because i look at this it feels like something somebody drew on the back of a you know napkin at some you know uh, at lucian or something they're sitting there having a drink and they drew this on the back of a napkin and had like a bit of an aha moment and then took this to the factory and then got it essentially kind of cut out onto some felt or whatnot and then got it made into a logo and stuck it onto a hat right so it's got that real kind of hand-drawn kind of feel like the same thing if you go and get a really nice tattoo by somebody and they sort of hand draw it and don't just trace it that's what it sort of feels like and i feel like i've got something weirdly enough in one of my lacy drives this is something that i usually you know don't promote but i did do this for a while where i made all these really cool designs in my opinion anyway i had all these ideas for merch when we were doing our club nights back in the day at the other buy which i've got loads of ideas for that never printed i've got ideas for like bomber jackets and car cargoes this is from ages ago when i used to really be into that stuff which is weird like now it's all that all that stuff is in but i've got it all stored on a lazy hard drive somewhere 
and I'm going to try and pull it out and see if I can get it done and made because I think that would make for a really cool hat into just something that I could just kind of sell all the time as a little beginner type project and something that I can kind of put out there because I do need to have some piece of product out there in terms of um, showing people what my you know my abilities are my taste levels are and what kind of things I want to do I think it'd be nice just to kind of do like a, a one throwaway type project how everyone kind of started right everyone kind of did one thing whether it was a hoodie where it was a bootleg t-shirt thing everyone's got this one thing they sort of started with as they sort of template and then they kind of built off of that or no as a launching point sorry not template so i'm definitely going to try and do this going forward but this hat is absolutely beautiful it sits really well even on the hat if it being a corduroy hat and it's got some dents and divots there but i still think the shape is absolutely fantastic these models that i made leon Doyle as well they make everything look so good these, I think they're twins, are these two black guys that did make everything look good. So big up those guys as well for being absolute swag masters. Um, but yeah, I love these hats. They look really nice. They come in like a car, it's like an olive, it's an olive cargo and a navy cargo. They've got the New York Yankees um, logo cut out, I guess, in some sort of level of felt or something, and then stashed on the front. And then they've also got Emily Leon Door written, embroidered on the side here in this really fantastic font also. This looks really good bit shaky in parts not the best quality control maybe more to do with the material of, of trying to try and stitch a embraided font on corduroy isn't probably the easiest it's probably going to come a bit fluffy but you know i would like there to be a little bit of quality control maybe some of the kerning here isn't the best in terms of the spacing and stuff but overall it's still a very exquisitely done hat oh it comes another color they've got another one too they've got um what's, what's that thing called oh, i don't know my new york stuff too much man uh let me not let me not google it and see this is i'm um, this is i'm assuming is it yank no they got new york yankees i wish i have a team that's the one that spike lee supports isn't it what's it called shit and they don't win anything oh. i don't know i forgot the name i wish i remember it but it's like an orange logo essentially i do i remember wish i remember the name of it but anyway i don't so i keep moving i'm sure people go home are going to be shouting at me or when they see this video they're going to be like oh my god how do you not know this but i'm sorry i don't and then you've got a nice leather strap here on the back also it looks pretty nice but for my gigantic hair it's not going to work the label is really nice also on the inside don't, don't you think a million dollar label it's really big i like these kind of obtuse big logos stitched on the inside when you take it off and you're flossing or you're scratching your head to kind of pat your fucking braids down and you put it on the flipping table and Baze is opposite you is flipping you know eating the Caesar salad and she peeps on the inside she's like oh homeboy's gonna get it you know what i mean because he's got a little a million dollar tag on the inside homeboy's definitely gonna get it but yeah i think these look really nice i'm a big fan of all okay what logo felt yes yeah, so, sorry it's not felt it's not i, I forgot what i said but it's a felt applique new era hat felt applique and i made in me myanmar 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 but yeah i'm definitely gonna use this as a launching pad to try and do my ld and hat which i've had on the back burner for a long long time so the fact that no one's done it is great because that means i can do it and absolutely smash the market and dominate and have them sell out and buy myself a tesla with the earnings <laughs> Oh my God. Moving on from that. Moving on from that. Let's talk about this stuff. Let's talk about this. So, talking about celebrity and stuff, I was thinking earlier on how, because I was thinking, I think no, I spoke earlier on in the podcast about how I made a solemn promise to myself to just leave people alone for the most part, especially people I look up to in this really niche, you know, interest field that I'm in when it comes to DJ, when it comes to design, when it comes to art and fashion and stuff. It's not really worth it because you don't really know how that person's going to receive your, you know, vociferous, in, you know, excitement for the things that you're into or for the love and appreciation of the things that they do and sometimes it can come across a bit weird especially if it involves a woman it can kind of come you know it's hard to avoid the whole creepiness of it it's hard to avoid it not being creepy so it's best just to kind of admire from afar and i think there's many platforms already that exist in terms of leaving comments in terms of liking posts in terms of sharing stuff on your own feed those are all ways that you can definitely take part and even if you want to just open a flipping fan account somewhere and just keep standing for them and just keep posting stuff about them all the time and that's a good way to kind of build a level of rapport with somebody also without really being too involved i feel like with all that kind of stuff but it also got me thinking about the different levels of celebrity and the different levels of fame and how 
they are quite nauseating to deal with and how the benefits or the negatives far outweigh the benefits for the most part. And it made me think about this video with, uh, what's his name? Ben Affleck recently at a deal book summit for the, with the New York times. I think it's the same thing that that guy from SVX was flipping for some reason being interviewed at and kind of copping pleas or whatever it may be. And he still made an appearance in there, even though he flipping scammed a bunch of people for billions and billions of dollars. But Ben Affleck was there, I guess, for a different reason, giving a talk. And he had some very sobering and interesting views on celebrity and fame overall, which I think are very interesting to kind of listen to and understand from the point of view, from his point of view, that maybe also it could impact the way that you maybe look at these celebrities and people and how you interact with them in the real world. So let's have a listen to what he has to say. I'm not built for to be famous. I don't like it. You can keep it. I really have not gotten any benefit from it other than, you know, I've gotten out of some speeding tickets and some restaurant reservations, and I don't wait in line at Disneyland, which may, in fact, be worth it if you've ever waited five hours to take a three-minute ride. But other than that, I'm not somebody, and I have no judgment around this, a lot of performers, kind of inherently, because nobody wants to play to an empty house, right? They want to have that attention. Part of it's a tree falling in the woods. If you are an artist, you want to have the audience experience your art, trying to generate empathy and move people. Well, if no one's there, so attention, people often conflate it with narcissism and solipsism and self-absorption. It's not really. What it is, is I'm somebody who wants to express something to people very profoundly, so all people there to respond to that. And that is sort of becomes a part of fame. And now fame has segued into this sort of you know, desire to see behind the curtain, and we want to see behind the curtain, behind the curtain, behind the curtain. And the truth is, behind the curtain is more boring, and behind the curtain, behind the curtain is more boring. It takes a lot of work and energy and dedication of a lot of people to create this illusion for two hours of something really interesting and, and captivating. The real people are not that interesting. And that's the <laughs> sobering truth about the whole thing. And like I said before, I think it must be really dizzying to be him and have that realization. But then it also made me think in general about the perfect levels of celebrity and what you'd want to maybe try to be and what's maybe advantageous. And it got me thinking about two areas, maybe specifically contemporary artists and professional DJs, where in their particular niche, they are very, very well known. You think of, um, you think of, uh, uh, you think of a Sarah Lucas, for instance, one of my favorites. Um, you think of a David Hockney, another kind of OGS doing great things, and a slew of others within the art space, or within the art field. If they're at a private view, if they're at a flipping auction, if they were at you know Miami Art Basel, they'll be getting absolutely you know uh, swarmed. But the moment they step away from that scene and they're just living their everyday life and they're you know off on vacation somewhere or they're shopping for some bits to eat and flipping waitros, no one's gonna bother them whatsoever. No one will probably know who they are, but. Same goes for like DJs, right? You think of a Charlotte DeWell, an Amy, uh, you know, an Amy Len, a Mealy Lens, a Peggy Goo, a Carl Cox, all these really big people, Deborah DeLuca, Nina Kravitz, when they're not in dance floor type situations, when they're not in cities where there's a predominantly nightlife type community and scene, they for the most part live a really innocuous kind of, you know, mundane life that nowhere really bothers them about. But the moment they step into that field, of course, they swarm. But outside of that, it's every day is kind of normal and chill. And that's probably the perfect type of celebrity that someone would want. Everyone would kind of want that kind of celebrity where you sort of get left alone for the most part and no one really bothers you for the most part. I think that's probably the best place to be if that was me for the most part. But again, you don't pick the scenes that you're in or the things that you're into. And sometimes that fame as well can be really intoxicating. It can be really hard to kind of let go and to kind of pull yourself away from that faucet as it's kind of streaming out and the tension's getting to you and it's making you get dizzy and it's making you feel as if like the more you do it the more successful it helps you and really for the most part especially we've seen now with social media it doesn't necessarily do much if you think about it in terms of really propelling your career what really propels your career unfortunately especially nowadays is mostly the work if the work isn't good it doesn't matter like if you're not in a good show which probably isn't your kind of in your control if you're an actor because you have to go and audition you have to hope you get picked so there's a lot of kind of hoping the moment is for you if you're not in the right movie if the movie isn't or show isn't directed by the right person doesn't have you know the a high level of you know showrunners on it or screenwriters you've seen already what's happened with um the show about flipping lord of the rings that was terrible that prequel v the house of the dragon and how great that was you know who was to know i guess that cast you know the cast of the flipping what's it called um the rings of power 
they probably had no idea the show was going to be shit until they started filming or maybe until they started reading the script they probably thought they were going to be in something that was going to be monumental and actually change things forever and change the course of their career when in actuality it probably hindered a lot of their careers because now they're associated with this woke mess but it's not really in your control but that of course is something that you kind of want to be a part of but for the most part if the work isn't good it doesn't matter like i think of one of my favorite actors nowadays is that um, guy charlie hume or well, it's how you pronounce his name charlie hume or charlie hunham the guy that's in sounds of anarchy and a few other bits and bobs and he for the most part avoids most press most interviews doesn't have any social media and basically lets the work talk for itself the work sometimes is a bit choppy it's a bit up and down in terms of the quality but i just like the way he navigates his career and kind of navigates his life he kind of treats you know work he kind of treats acting like a job and keeps his, his family and all that sort of stuff life separate and i'm sure because he's not really out and about and in your face it probably does affect the way he kind of navigates the world also he probably gets left alone because it's kind of like the adage people have of meeting celebrities in really weird places like usually if you're a celebrity the higher profile you are the more regular things you do day to day the more people will leave you alone the more special you walk around and you make it into an event you have a million security guards and you're stopping traffic it turns into a situation but if you just leave it all and kind of you know or if you just go to places that people don't expect you to be at or you just act completely normal it really doesn't turn into that big of a deal it's really odd how that kind of happens but uh big up ben affleck for the sobering and interesting perspective into being a celebrity and how fame isn't always cracked up to be i thought that was pretty interesting to be honest but the irony of it also is you don't get with jennifer lopez if you're not famous you know that's the irony of it jennifer lopez isn't dating her fedex guy right she's not dating she's not dating him she's not dating the guy that's doing the picking and packing at the amazon fulfillment center unfortunately sorry my guys out there at the amazon fulfillment center you you have no chance of flipping to you know j-lo doesn't matter how much money you make over there it's not it's not gonna happen so fame can be somewhat beneficial because it allows you access to people who you probably wouldn't have access to but everyday life things probably not the greatest then moving on with that talking about fame which i think was awesome as well to kind of segue off of this it's been the whole sweet year affair with the whole her selling 2k um album copies or i think it's an ep i'm not sure if it's an album is it an album let's see in the club what does it say here it says the this the single life okay it, it doesn't say it's ep so i want to call it an album so she released this album called the single life and it sold 2000 copies first week and everybody's obviously been panning her and ripping her to shreds on the internet about it and for the most part the you know the response is somewhat justified because i guess for some people's eyes she's the person who brought down the amigos or maybe played a part in those guys not being together in their final moments unfortunately r.i.p takeoff which is unfair to judge her and to blame her for that but you know how some people are when they're in fandom and when they're grieving you know kind of try to point the finger at anybody to try and make it sense make it make sense maybe some people also if you're a cardi b fan you're not a fan of her because you feel like she's a home wrecker because she says she come in and purposely maybe hasn't confirmed yet possibly might have maybe not fucked off set which maybe led to the group breaking up we're not too sure of either but what i do feel like this is a good reminder is that for the most part if you're somebody of her ilk or why i think this didn't work out is that i wasn't aware of any singles and usually when you're promoting an album like this it's usually a single or two that you put out in order for people to anticipate the album dropping now the singles don't have to be on the album that's a trick also i think a lot of people do where they have a single that's not actually on the album but it's just to use as a bit of content that you can kind of springboard off of and use as a conversation piece to engage your audience engage the media and whatnot and start to kind of press run in terms of getting your album promo out there so it doesn't always have to be album cuts that could end up being a single but i didn't really hear nothing that really kind of compelled me to kind of keep an eye on it in terms of that and I'm somebody that keeps an eye on album releases. I'm kind of following all the correct pages in terms of getting a heads up on what's going to drop, you know, and, you know, following certain websites and whatnot. And I had no idea this was dropping, legitimately zero. The only maybe inkling I could have had was because of that freestyle she put out that was meant to be the tell all and meant to give her side in terms of the whole sordid affair behind the rumors that she might have you know stepped the offset and whatnot which might have led to the him getting essentially excommunicated from the amigos and quavo and she's saying that he's not family or whatnot anymore going forward maybe who knows if that's particularly true but when the freestyle did come out it was very underwhelming didn't actually say too much it felt like a bit of a honey dick a bit of a cock tease and it kind of amounted to absolutely nothing but apart from that the promo was terrible so for sure her team 
team needs to be blamed and held accountable for that for sure they didn't really promote the album well and for the most part they then got their just dues and their punishment because then the album didn't sell and you know we are what we are in that regard but what i do think this is a good thing for especially someone like myself who's an up-and-coming dj and kind of trying to you know pursue that as a career going forward and especially something i want to do in the latter years of my life is something i want to do just continually on the side it is quite sobering to see that even though this person has 300 or sorry 13 million followers on instagram and however many she might have on other social media platforms all combined maybe 20 it may be 30 but it's a lot of millions in terms of all that stuff what i like is that when it comes to creative work when it comes to actually creating products that people want to enjoy there is no cheating of the numbers so for sure it can it's safe to say that this follower account my amount is probably not legit and what it does show is that most people i'd probably say 99 percent, maybe 90 percent of the people in the industry on the entertainment or in the arts they have especially if it requires some level of social media presence most of them guys have fake metrics it's not real all of their metrics is wrong all of their follower accounts you know amounts are wrong the amount of likes they have on their pictures are fake sorry um followers account followers they have is fake the comments they have is fake all that engagement is all fake for the most part and I, and i know why they do it it does make sense because this pays because if you say to somebody that you have 30 million followers what that does is that that allows you to then try and go out there and get brand deals against your amount of followers that you have because the brands want to get in front of those 13 million and advertise their product services or wares so this makes all the sense why people do go out there and buy followers buy views and whatnot the harmful thing with that in the long run is that it doesn't serve you if you don't if your work isn't good it doesn't serve you and usually if you're just starting out cheating the system that way and making yourself look like you're further in your career than you should be is also not a good thing because it just you know it just kind of when when it gets down to the brass knocks of it and you start getting deals or opportunities that would kind of be you know uh, equivalent to a level that you're kind of purporting to be something will definitely end up giving and it won't be the greatest thing for you so, and i also think for me personally as, a, as an artist coming up as somebody who wanting to make a no name for themselves you're much better off starting from the ground zero of getting one play and that, you know, doubling up to 10 to 1,000 to 10,000 slowly in incremental steps than you are to try and fake that you've got a thousand plays from the jump when no one knows who you are. You're better off starting from absolute zero because that's how you actually build a fan base that's actually going to stick with you for the majority of your life. Now, there are other stories where it's kind of different. I think of the Travis Scott thing where he essentially did a lot of faking it till you make it but he you know had maybe did it for the point of view of like knowing i've got the talent i've got the ability i just need to present myself in a certain way look a particular way on the internet um how these particular sounds associate to me and then once i get people interested i can then bang with the head with the stuff that i actually do that's one way to do it but it's a very risky you know option to do and not a lot of people can succeed doing it but i think it's very advantageous i would say to just be somebody starting off small starting a very niche and kind of building up because if a follower account was three million if it was 5 million, if it was 6 million, if it was 10, if it was even 8, this would maybe add up a little bit. But I feel like sometimes keeping your followers account somewhat legit, keeping your sub somewhat legit, keeping your view count, your play count somewhat legit can really serve in the long run because once you end up building up your esteem and your career, it ends up getting a bit better. Because I see a lot with these DJ live streams I watch a lot of times, I see people get like a thousand views, 100,000. I'm like, it's impossible that 100,000 people are watching this. This is terrible. It's not that great. And also, you know, they're not that, they're not as big as they're trying to make it seem as. It's just a little bit, it doesn't, it's a bit of a mismatch. And ultimately what happens is that I'm sure behind the scenes, bookers go out and book some of these people because they have, you know, 100,000 streams or 100,000 sorry, views of their live stream on Horror or on Boiler Room, they then get booked to play somewhere and they can't move more than 20 tickets. Then suddenly this promoter in Romania is like thinking, huh? Right? Like, it's a smaller market. You're trying to get people to come out into your flipping new club and then you essentially spunk all this money in the DJ that can't fill a room of 250 people. 
that's a real problem so it ends up catching up with you in the end so i think the good thing about this is that it shows that even though in the beginning she probably botted a lot of her followers and so because i still don't believe this followers account is real especially for the amount of people that actually will end up buying her album it still ends up going to be a good thing because what it will end up doing is giving you a lesson and showing you that you know what it's better to start humble start small and then kind of build up from there going forward so i feel like this will end up being a net positive because it'll show that there's a lot of work to do in terms of getting her fan base back where it needs to be. That's definitely the main place to be. And also there's a lot of you know work to do in order to kind of engage the fan base again in terms of trusting what she does, because that's the thing people don't really speak about enough. Also, once you put out too much shit work, your fans move on to other people and there's plenty of artists out there. Yes, she's a beautiful girl and everything, but you know there's plenty of hot girls out there that make music. So you're not like the only person. So you can't keep putting out terrible work and think your fans are going to still be there for you. you have to treat them with some you know hint of respect and honor their time and their money and stuff so hopefully this is a time to go back to a drawing board with this sort of thing the only concern would be for me is that i do remember a story a few months ago about sweetie where she went away to some kind of writer's camp to sharpen her pen and sharpen her ability to make music in some far away place somewhere in the caribbean then there was that, that interview she did i think with kevin Hart, where she's talking about shaving her hair and how that centered her and brought her back to her womanhood and i don't know this all this nonsense right about kind of going to all these extra steps outside of the arts to kind of give yourself that push that you needed to deliver good work that's what basically she was doing all these kind of other things in life that would help her make great art and kind of help her tap in and for the most part we've not seen any fruits of that labor we saw a pretty decent okay performance at rolling loud where she had that you know rihanna so um, um beyonce outfit on right with the jean shorts and the white top and stuff right that was somewhat okay but still wasn't the greatest people were just looking at her and her figure straightening around the stage more so than the quality of the music so it made me think we all had that friend in school especially if you're older if you're over the age of 25 and stuff you would know you had that friend in school who still was trying to pursue music was still trying to be a rapper still trying to be a singer a dj uh have a band or whatever and you had the other friend also that was trying to make it maybe make it in sports uh, after the age of 25 right they're still going to trials for professional teams same professional teams and whatnot and there comes a time where they ask for your opinion and you sometimes are in a position where you like the reality of it is if you haven't made it by now and you've been playing football from like the age of like 10 maybe younger and you're now 25 the chances of you becoming pro are very slim they're not impossible because there are always anomalies out there there are always these amazing stories of people who were playing sunday league at 32 got spotted and then now here they are playing league one league two championship even premier league football a few years after living their absolute dream they can happen those are the beautiful parts of life and football that make life worth living amazing sure the same thing happens in music also you hear busking uh, you know on the central line platform somewhere someone recognizes you and here you are you get signed a deal i think of that guy who was busking that asap rocky bumped into right and he ended up appearing on a couple of asap rocky albums and i'm sure even now to this day he probably has a decent music career just with that one interaction he had with rocky back in the day so it can help but for the most part most people if you haven't made it by a particular time especially when it comes to the arts or other hobbies that you're doing trying to make them professional you're probably better off just quitting but who would want to be the friend that tells someone that you love that's dear to you that they should maybe hang up their boots and not try to, you know, go to another trial because it's a waste of their time that you maybe stay at home and look after their family. They should maybe take their kid out to Disneyland, right? Um, take their missus shopping, buy their kids some new shoes or something like instead of wasting that money to go and pay for another place to go play somewhere. Like how do you tell someone someone like that, something like that? And I think to myself, looking at this sweet 2K thing, it's just another one of those situations where maybe this is the universe telling her, hey, you're never really destined to be a musical artist in any kind of sound, you know, because maybe, you know, 2000s maybe in a lot because people bought it because they like the cover and they like what she looks like in that illustration. Who knows? But maybe this is a universe's way of telling you that this isn't for you. But how do you realize that? How do you know this is a sign and this is not just a temporary setback? How do you take that kind of stuff on board? And it's kind of hard to sort of like pass and make sense in your head. But I was looking at it thinking, you know what, this is similar to this guy. Because I've had a lot of those friends growing up 
that I've still been trying to make it professional, still going to trials and stuff, still going to open days and say like, open trials, close trials, ringing up agents, uploading clips of themselves playing football on YouTube. You know, it's probably as pathetic as I am doing when I upload flipping sets of myself DJing at fucking Paris Studio and try and make it look fucking professional. It's probably as pathetic as that. But how do you tell somebody to stop and give it up? Especially if they find solace or they find fun in that hobby, like I do, right? If some Bergheim book happens to stumble across my channel and they're like, oh yeah, we like that Agostino guy, let's book him to play Panorama Bar, of course I'll be chuffed. But for the most part, I'm playing for a room of one, right? For the most part. But it's still enjoyable enough. That's the hard part to kind of get right in your head. It's still enjoyable for it to make sense. But then you're still in the back of your head, have this little expectation that you, it's going to work out for you and you might end up getting the place. So you need to get to with this. So I don't know. I'm not too sure when it comes to this or stuff, who tells those people these kind of things, but it is kind of something to kind of wrangle in your head when a good friend of yours, not just a, you know, a casual acquaintance, fair enough. You can lie and kind of keep it moving, but someone you actually love coming up to you and saying, Hey, have you listened to my new mix? What do you think? Um, did you see my clip that uploaded for that football trial I meant to go to for some team in Turkey or Cyprus or whatnot? What do you think? Um, what do you think of my song I put up on SoundCloud? Like all that sort of stuff. So, oh, should I be honest and tell you that I think this is not going to happen for you and it's not in your destiny? Or should I just be the inspiring friend or the motivational friend that just supports you regardless? And if it doesn't work out, I'm still here to kind of put my arm around your shoulder and buy you a drink anyway. Who knows what the right solution is, but this is something that's been at the front of my mind. Next on this list, I want to quickly talk about is Bergheim revealing their New Year's Eve events that are going to be happening for the, what is it, three days or something? It's absolutely crazy bonanza. So this is called the Sylvester Club Nacht, which is Club Night 2022, courtesy of RA. It says features dozens of acts across four rooms in New Year's Eve event that will run from December 30th through to January 2nd. So it's going to be an absolute blockbuster. For me, first of all, I don't think this is going to be possible to do this year. I really would want to go one year and do the whole event from the start to the finish. It's absolutely one my dream to do so, but it's probably going to have to wait another year for that to absolutely make you make sense. But from what I've heard, it's absolutely barnstormingly busy. And most events are like that. I think the one coming up in two weeks, which is the 18th birthday, is going to be absolutely ram jam. So there's two scenarios. Either you go to these type of events just to say you've gone feel the vibe of it being super busy and touristy and full of locals and stuff and just rammed from beginning to end or the other kind of little heads up to to note with these sort of things is usually the couple of weeks after a big event are usually the best times to go to Bergheim they're usually empty all the tourists have left it's usually full of locals or regulars whoever they like to be to be referred as and the vibe is just perfect I've been a couple of times before that I've been like the first weekend um, that it ran after New Year's Eve because I think they closed for a little bit they have a little bit of a rest and relaxation. They probably spring clean the entire place and get it back to spick and span. But I think they closed. I don't know if a couple of weeks or one week. But I remember going a, a week. They opened or reopened after New Year's Eve. And it was absolutely slamming. And I went in a couple of times after they did like a Easter or May Day event also. That was really, really fun. So it's twofold. But if you haven't been before, then probably it's nice to kind of just go and see it full at full tilt. Because that really works. But the queues will be astronomical. And sometimes as well, the things about the busy events is that they reach capacity. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter how long you queue. Sometimes if it's full, it's full. And sometimes you can't get in for like four hours. And that's happened to me last time when I went to the, I went to the makeup one. I went to the one that did for the, for 2021. So that was early in the month, early in the year. That might've been like June or something. And that was a rammed and I had to wait outside. That's the longest I've ever waited in the Burkhan queue. That must've been like four hours waiting outside. It was horrendous. Having bare people try and line cut, which didn't work with me. I was doing mad. Oi, get to the back, taps on the shoulder. I wasn't having it, mate. Not in the slightest, especially after waiting four hours. Fair enough if it's like, you know, you're near the front and stuff where maybe people are meeting up their friends, cool, but just going in there and not saying anything is a bit out of order, to be honest, for the most part. But hey, let's continue with the article. Bergans announced the lineup for the New Year's Eve club. So that's the club night. Um, the Berlin's annual New Year's Eve marathon is one of the most popular parties running from the 30th of January through the 2nd. This year's event will feature dozens of acts split across four spaces, Panorama Bar, uh, Berghain, 
um, whatever that word is there, saloon and the XXX floor, which I think is a floor named, renamed um, for laboratory, if I'm not mistaken. That's the one that's usually the gay only night that happens sporadically here or there. Um, but it's really popular as well. And it's one of my favorite rooms, to be fair. It says highlights in Bergheim include RA cover star Helen the Health, Sir Steffi, Ben Clock, DJ Nobu, Legend, Jacko Jacko, Rudd Had, Tasha, Avalon Emerson, IF, OK Williams, Paramita, Ryan Elliott, DJ Holographic, and more playing a panel bar. That's a splendid lineup of panel bar, to be honest. And um, the energy will be a uh, downbeat for the salon, it's featuring Space Africa, Tobias, Marcus Sh Marco Shuttle, Rabib Biani, who also play uh, live, and uh, XXX Floor, on the other hand, will feature Boris, Cormac, Lakuti, Soundstream, and Tamo Sumo. Before Le Sylvester, Bergen will also celebrate his 18th birthday, weekend of December. As you can see here, David, El El how does it say, David Elimilik? Uh, Mary Moxamia, who's one of my favorite new discoveries, seen a couple a couple of times. This lady is absolutely boss. Partook Roy Perez, who I've always been a big fan of a Panorama Bar on Christmas Day at the end of 2022. Bergheim is closing his world renowned agency. You already know that. So let's have a look at the lineup and what it's looking like. It looks tasty. So obviously here you've got, it's running from the 3rd of December all the way until Monday. That is flipping nuts, to be honest. That is a real solid session to be a part of. I don't know how you guys are going to handle it. If you've been there, I'm really curious to know if there are people who've ever actually gone there and done the entire thing without leaving. I'm sure there are people that have done that for sure. Um, I would love to know if how what that is and what that feels like when you come out and you're all delirious and stuff and you come out on the second you go on the thirtieth and you come out on Monday the second like what does that actually feel like I remember the the last time I've ever done that might have been like 2017 2016 where I've left when it closes where they close but I mean when you all come out together and it's like 10 a.m in the morning on a monday and it's a bit of a trip you're all delirious and like you know in a bit of a loop and everyone rushes to the train station that's awesome awesome but the lineup is really really nice for for burger and obviously you got all the regular suspect that you would assume there you got diary who a lot of people are not really big fans of it feels like nowadays they feel like there's a bit of nepotism involved with her getting slots there the ben clock that i'm a big fan of dj nobu japanese absolute legend how who i really have a big time for helena how who i'd love to see play live in there who i think would be awesome playing that kind of um platform especially given new year's eve the way she plays her style and stuff will be absolutely fantastic face for tab obviously got not nothing but good things to say about him steffi and virginia and tasha great but p bar for me is the best lineup so far avalon emerson bashka hot dj holographic um up and coming detroit flipping legend here fidel fka dot m4a that'd be really fun Gabriel Kuateng, also I'm a big fan of. Massimiliano Pellegrini, Pellegrini, also I'm a big fan of. Auto and that is a uh, resident there. And Bao Camo is also really awesome and really nice. He's one person I did bump into say hi one time at P Bar, and he was really nice and personable. Paramida, Roy Perez, Steffi, and um, who else is there? Soundstream is it? I saw no, that's one P Bar, and an XSX floor. <laughs> this is my favorite room, by the way. Um, this is my favorite and I think that I have some itch pictures here that show the inside because this might be my favorite room because I've only discovered it recently so when I went in June for that makeup session for the Sylvester that meant to happen in 2020 for 2021 but obviously because of the pandemic it didn't happen so they had one in the middle of the year which was a bit weird but they did it anyway and it was really really fun it was the first time i ever has been exposed to the xxx floor because this is usually only reserved for the laboratory nights which are usually their gay only nights and let me tell you, the architecture for that place is awesome. Obviously, you got this, you know, this is from the architectural firm that designed the interior of Berghain. But then to show you what flipping that room looks like, you've got some pictures here, courtesy of flipping Google, that show you a bit of it, that kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. So you've got all these flipping, you know, crazy um seats and stuff as you can see yeah right it's made for being naughty and getting up to all sorts of perverse things as you can see there on that text, right? But what I loved about it is the dj booth and what that looks like because as you can see here i think there's a picture from a lady gaga set i guess right we played there maybe one time these are little stairs that lead up into the little cage where the dj plays and i think it's here you see in the picture there there's a little picture there with like a fence and that's where the djs are so it's kind of like a stairs you go up to you turn right and the booth's right in there where they play so they're kind of playing down to you and it's an absolutely phenomenal room oh you see daily gaga there actually that's awesome she played at a laboratory back in the day absolute legend 
So that is one of my favorite rooms that I've recently discovered. That's a real, real vibe. And then they have people dancing on the flipping um, bar as well. It kind of reminds me of a scene of some kind of dystopian movie where people are dancing and rocking out and having a great time. It's honestly one of the best. The logo is really nice also, I think. That was a nice logo to put on a t-shirt. I think, sure, they've got merch. I'm pretty sure they've got merch on merch with this logo on the burger and store that he actually purchased i'm pretty sure but i like the logo of it i think that looks fresh to death and then obviously you can see some pictures of it also but that room for me was one of my favorites and one of my best recent discoveries that i've ever had of going to the flipping burger which i've been going to for a very very long time but i thought that was one of my best and most favorite recent discoveries let's see if i can find any more pictures from this event because this is really, really cool to see if there's any more things that can be taken from it. Because that, that little section inside of there was absolutely beautiful to check out. So I guess this is for, what was this for an event? This is atmosphere for celebrating the private after show party for Monster Ball Tour. Okay, cool. Uh, this is 2010. Lady Gaga event at Paramount. Oh my God, look at these ladies in blackface. That's a bit wild, isn't it? That's a bit wild. <laughs> that's a picture you don't want to go viral again. But look at these haircuts from back in the day. Do you remember that? That's a that's the jacket that everyone used to wear back in the day. That was a very cool look in the indie scene. This kind of um, what would you call it? This kind of admiral captain's kind of jacket thing. The ironic pins, the big scarf, the bleach blonde hairs. Oh my god, this is definitely a moment back in the day. That looks like somebody I recognise. Isn't it? Who, who is this? It looks like an artist or somebody. I forgot who that is. It looks somebody familiar. Lady Gaga looking absolutely incredible. Always a moment in terms of her outfits and makeup. Love that. What do we see here also? Maybe there's some icons as well just starting here that we're not aware of that maybe still around. Oh, look, she's got the... I remember I had that jacket. Do you remember that jacket? That's from back in the day from Pata. The varsity jacket that they made to tie with their flipping Air Maxes that I sold. I had two pairs of Air Maxes. Let's see if I can find a look at them. Pata, Nike, Air Max. It was the first one. It was like a plush brown type of one. And I sold mine for, I think, for like a thousand back in the day. Let's see if I can find them. This one, yeah, that's the one. The para. I think it was a para pattern, right? So, yeah, see? what <gasps> They're going for 12,000 now. Oh, my God. Para. Let's see. Jesus Christos. I forgot which one I had. I think I had these ones. I don't think I had a friends and family one. For sure, I didn't have a friends and family but I do remember having these and selling them. They're going for twelve k now. Well, I sold mine for a thousand, so I probably got <laughs> I probably got ripped off by for the most part, as you can see. I probably got ripped off, but yeah, I had those. So that was a matching jacket that went with that. And you got some pictures of somebody performing there, as you can see, leading up to the stairs. You got a picture with somebody. Who's this? That's Palina Ron. I don't know who this is. Who's Palina Ronjinski? Let's see who this lady is. I have no idea who this person is. Let's see if they're still around doing some things. This is a Russian television presenter. Okay, cool. Russian German television presenter. She's still about now doing good things. So big up her. And then who's the guy next to her? This is Sven Kittler Lauder. Kill two Lauder or someone. I don't know who that is. Let's see who this is. Is it a money man? Oh yeah, some sort of playboy money man. I guess they were in a relationship, I guess, probably. Senior director, creator, and public figure. So I guess maybe they're in a relationship, right? This these people, I'm assuming. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, who knows. But yeah, what an amazing time capture to look back on, isn't it? Posh performing there. Lady Gaga DJing in laboratory in 2010 in Bergheim. Pretty and cool, isn't it? But yeah, for the most part, that's the stairs you can stand up. And I guess the reason why I bring this up in laboratory is that this is why I saw Pablo Boozy play for the first time and absolutely tear that place apart. So I can't wait to see that guy DJ again. He was absolutely amazing. But yeah, look, that XXX room... Or the laboratory is probably one of my favorite spaces in that place. Um, this blackface sort of stuff is absolutely incredible. <laughs> I guess it's mud, maybe, it's, but I don't know what it is, but this is absolutely hilarious. Uh, there's some guy from Semi Precious Weapons. Who's Justin? Who the hell is that? Well, where are all these people now, I wonder? Justin Semi Precious Weapons. Is he still about? Yeah, I guess he is Justin. Was. was. Or did he pass away? What happened to him? Okay, the members of the band. Who's the Messi? Okay, his name. Okay, because it's got Justin Trainter. I think he's probably still around, right? Same person was a band. Is Justin Trainter still about? Yeah, he looks like he is. 
Justin Turner is an American songwriter, frequently collaborating with Julia Michaels. He's written songs for Britney Spears, Gwen Stefani, and Linkin Park. Bloody hell, pretty cool, man. What a time capsule to see all these people wearing this what t-shirt and covering themselves in mud. Maybe it's part of the Monster album, I'm not really too sure. But yeah, big up flipping. Big up her, innit? Big up her hanging out, doing the thing, having an absolute ballast of the time. What was this story with a muscle tight gay club bird and bird? Let's see if they got it. Do we have any more pictures of here from Berg? Let's see if we've got more here that we can check out from A E D T. Because I'm surprised they even let people take pictures here. There's some 2011 pictures featuring Sven. Look at that. That's a time capsule, isn't it? From back in the day. I guess it's an art gallery thing, so it makes things a bit different. So you do get pictures of the place outside of it being a club, which is pretty cool to see. But apart from that, it's not really that time at all in the slightest. Damn. And then what other ones we have here? Exhibition. We have a Levi's party from 2011. Lady Gaga event. Another one with Sven. More Lady Gaga events there. Bloody hell, we have an Elon Musk event here. I guess it's during lockdown probably, I imagine so. But yeah, absolutely crazy, crazy, crazy amount of events. But this New Year's Eve event is going to be flipping crazy. XSX Floor with Boris, you know, probably worth already. It's waiting gold. Cormac, one of my favorite, again, recent or semi-recent discoveries in terms of discovery type music. Absolute monster when it comes to playing that sort of stuff. So definitely check this guy out if you haven't already. Where's he playing in the UK next? Oh, he's not playing in London for a while, isn't it? Until... February of next year, Bamba. Uh, Origins alongside Cormac, Chris Cruz. So him and Chris Cruz. So I wonder who's who they. Who are they? Uh, who's their booking agency? Show booking info. Temporary secretary because I'd imagine because he's always I see I see flipping Cormac always on the same lineup says um what's his face Chris Cruz. So I'd imagine they're probably part of the same team, but. Again, there's some pictures of the inside of Berger if you want to check that out also. These are pretty cool. You can check that out from an architectural firm that does it. Obviously, it doesn't really be being there in person, of course. This is temporary secretary. Let's see who they've got on their lineup. Is it going to make open my email? These are open my email. Please don't be that site does that stuff. Okay, I see artists. Let's see who they've got. Yeah, see, they've got... Um, is Cormac on there? Yeah, Cormac is on there. So it's the same. They've got the same... Uh, agency i guess no there's no chris cruz i can't see him but i don't know maybe this doesn't matter so who they got on here right now oh they got dixon jimmy jules arm of course dennis horvat holographic tennis jennifer cardini god jansen okay these are they're part of um temporary secretary this is definitely the the roster that i want to be a part of really dj fuck off is on there too wow oh, big big up her that's a good look that's an amazing look. Big up to her. Very, very nice. Howling, we love to shine. Who else is on there? Also, to double check before I go back to the lineup. Nico Stoja, I'm not too sure. Roman Flugel, Tur, Tricks, and Tess. Okay, really, really splendid. That's a fucking decent list of people, though. Let's be, um, let's be for real, though. Let's not even muck around. That's a really decent list. But yeah, let's go back to the lineup for that. Before we end here, we've got that. We've got Lakuti, of course, Nemo, Peach, Peach on No Fuzz, who I'm not really too, Peach on No Fuzz, so I'm not really too um familiar with. Soundstream would be absolutely amazing in that room. Tamasuma and Valley Budino. But yeah, this will be an absolute bounce on an event. Probably end up going to be 40 euros. I'm assuming 50 euros will be entry. Re entry, maybe about 20 for the most part. Probably the same as before, or maybe more, I'm not too sure, but it'll definitely be worth worth. It's weight in gold if you haven't been already. Definitely, definitely worth its weight in gold. Anyway, that has been the Excellent English Show episode number 625. Thanks a lot for tuning in and being patient. I do appreciate every single one of you. If it's your first time tuning to the show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the audio podcast you hear, tune in today. There's also a link to my website, excellentzinger.com. You can find all the information about myself on there. So I'll be doing a DJ live stream later on tomorrow. That should be fun. And um, if you want to check out anything else regarding myself, all my socials are on excellentzinger.com. And yeah, man, thanks again for tuning in, watching the video thing. It won't do anything. It will just fade to black. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care and peace.